When trying to solve a computational problem, there are often multiple ways of thinking about a solution to that problem. Take, for example, this function for calculating the length of a list. We've seen it before. The way we've written this function captures how we define the length of a list. The length of an empty list is defined to be zero. The length of a non-empty list with a head and a tail is defined to be one more than the length of the tail. In essence, we're approaching this problem by thinking about what the length is. An alternative approach would be to approach the problem by thinking about what we would have to do in order to calculate the length of a list. For each of the elements in the list, we might add one to a counter, and once we reach the end of the list, whatever value is stored in the counter is our length. Both approaches get us to the same answer, but the second approach is what we call procedural programming, programming based on carrying out a procedure that involves commands that have side effects, and with those commands often executed repeatedly in loops. There are a few different kinds of loops provided by OCaml. The first is the while loop, which looks like this. We have the keyword while, followed by a condition expression, and then the keywords do and done. In between, we have a body expression. When evaluating the loop, we first evaluate the condition expression. If it's true, we evaluate the body expression, and then repeat the process. Evaluate the condition again, if it's true, run the body expression, and repeat again and again until the condition expression evaluates to false, at which point we exit the loop. So here's what an iterative procedural version of the length function might look like, implemented using a while loop. We first set a variable counter to be a reference to the integer zero, and list ref to be a reference to the input list. We're using references here because these are values that we'll want to mutate. Our function will update the counter to keep track of how many elements we found, and will update the list reference to keep track of which elements are left to be processed. Now we have our loop. The loop will repeat as long as the value referenced by list ref isn't the empty list. In other words, as long as list ref references a list with at least one element. Inside of the loop, we'll first increment the counter, and then update list ref to be the tail of whatever list ref currently refers to. So each time this loop repeats, we increase the counter and update the list to be the tail of the list. This repeats for every element in the list until we update the list to be the empty list, at which point we exit the loop and return the result of dereferencing the counter, which will give us the number of elements in the list. In addition to while loops, OCaml also has for loops that can count from some starting value to some ending value. A for loop lets us assign a variable to the value of some initial expression and count up to some ending expression. Inside the for loop is some body expression that can make reference to that variable. So this for loop, for example, has the variable x start at 1 and count up to 5. Within the loop, we might do something presumably something that has a side effect. Loops generally only make sense when we're working with side effects, something like updating a variable or printing something to the screen, since that would be the only reason we'd ever want to evaluate the same expression multiple times. In a language without side effects, there would be no purpose in evaluating the same expression multiple times, since each time the expression would always evaluate to the same value. In this case, we're choosing to print the variable's value using the printf function. So when the loop runs, we'll get the values 1 through 5 printed in a loop. For loops in OCaml can also count down, too. So we could write a loop that counts down from 5 to 1, for example. So loops give us a different way of solving problems. But what are the trade-offs? If we compare the two implementations of our length function, one pure recursive functional solution, and one impure iterative procedural solution, why would we prefer one over the other? The functional approach looks simpler in this case, so what reasons might we have for choosing procedural programming? One possible advantage is that procedural programming might be able to save us stack space. Let's take a closer look at the functional implementation of this length function. As part of its computation, we need to recursively call the length function again, so our original call to length is suspended while we wait for the recursive call to evaluate to a value, and then we add 1 to the result. 
that recursive call might also need to be suspended as it calls the length function again, waits for it to evaluate to a value, and then add one. Every time a function is called, it takes up some space in what's known as a stack frame. And every time a function needs to call another function and then do something with the result of that function, we need another stack frame. So if a function calls itself many times, we might end up with a growing stack of stack frames, each representing some suspended computation. That growing stack of frames can't grow infinitely. Eventually, we'll hit some limit based on how much space for stack frames is available in our computer. If we call the length function on a long enough list, we'll get a stack overflow, the result of too many stack frames. The iterative solution to calculating the length of a list, meanwhile, doesn't run into this problem. It's never calling itself recursively, so we don't need a new stack frame each time we consider a new element of the list. By using iteration, we've saved on stack space. That said, there is a way we can rewrite our recursive function to avoid using so much space for stack frames by taking advantage of a technique known as tail recursion. Here's the insight behind tail recursion. In our original version of the length function, the reason we needed to suspend our call and then add a new stack frame is because when the nested call returns a value, we need to do something with the resulting value, adding one in this case. So we have to store information about that pending computation in its own stack frame. But instead, if our function could just return the result of the nested call, rather than needing to do some additional computation with the result of the nested call, then there would be no need to store any stack frame for a pending computation. Here's what that might look like. This is a tail recursive version of the length function. It defines an auxiliary function length plus, which will accept a list and return the length of the list plus whatever the value of this accumulator is. So if we call length plus on a list and zero, that's just the length of the list. Inside of length plus, we match the list. If it's empty, then the result is whatever the value of the accumulator is. And if it has a head and a tail, then the length is going to be length plus of the tail and the value we get after incrementing the accumulator by one. The logic is slightly different, but you should be able to convince yourself that this will successfully compute the length of the list. What's interesting about this version of the function is that when length plus makes its recursive call to length plus, it doesn't need to wait for the recursive call to return in order to do something with the result. Whatever the recursive call returns is the result. So there's no need to store an additional stack frame for each pending computation, since there is no pending computation left to do. This is tail recursion, and tail recursive functions have the benefit of not needing to build up a stack of calls to keep track of pending computations, saving space and avoiding the problem of stack overflows. Another advantage of using procedural programming is that it can save on the space we need to store data structures. Take, for example, the map function we've seen several times now in a functional programming context. We take some list and return a new list that's the result of applying some function to each element in the original list. But importantly, when we evaluate the map function on a list, we get a new list as a result. The original list is still there, unchanged. The map function built that new list using the cons operator, which necessarily required taking up some additional space. Compare that to an iterative version of map that might work on a mutable data type like an array. Here, we map over an array by using a for loop that counts from zero up to the maximum valid index in the array and updates the element at that index in the array to be the result of applying some function to whatever is at that index. This function also applies a function to each element in a sequence of elements, but it does so by directly modifying the original sequence. We don't need any extra space to store a separate sequence of elements. But there's a trade-off here too. By mapping the elements this way, we've lost access to the original values in the array. The array now holds only our new values. So when to use functional programming and when to use procedural programming is a judgment call. Depending on the problem you're trying to solve, one set of trade-offs might outweigh another. But know that procedural programming via the use of loops like while loops and for loops 
is a tool available to you, and it does have benefits. Benefits like saving stack space and saving on the space required for data structures.